Over to you, Julius. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for that one uh, warm introduction. Once again, I'm Julia Sanotewa, um, a civil engineer with uh, over 17 years experience. And I've worked with a different uh, organization in the, the government and the business side, as well as the NGO. So today I share with you from uh, a wealth of experience I've gathered over the different years. We need to understand how to position ourselves for procurement. How do you position yourself for government procurement? That is our topic today. And uh, that's briefly my profile. I uh, have a bachelor's in civil engineering and with a postgraduate qualifications in construction management. I've studied procurement in uh, SIUPS and uh, I've done training, several other trainings, also including uh, training in PPP. And I've also practiced in different areas. I said in the government and the private sector. So I'm trying to share with you what we do and what I've, I've basically done over time, my experience. So today, my presentation has, uh, this is outline. We have some key definitions, uh, the business opportunities available from government. What does the government procure in case you're interested? How does the government procure or do business? Uh, the procurement cycle, you need to understand the procurement cycle if you are to do business. And then uh, we need to understand how, where are these opportunities, where are they advertised? There's a government tender portal, where some of these opportunities are advertised. And you need to know how to qualify to participate in a government procurement business and how to position oneself for the opportunities. And this will tell about different schemes. Government has different preference schemes, which are reserved for Ugandans. So you need to understand how do you qualify to get in there. And of course, a few of challenges and conclusions. Then you shall have a Q&A session. So if I'm defining government, it's a group of people with authority to govern a country. Uh, it could be at different levels. It could be at the ministry, it could be a region. And certain times, government has very specialized sector institutions which are designated and authorized to manage certain sectors. For example, like agriculture, we have like NADs. We have like energy, we have like era, some, that's part of government. This is, this is what we call the MDAs, ministries, departments, and agencies. And the government of Uganda, as per the constitution of 1985, is a republican constitution. And uh, the different governments are and the ministries, departments, and agencies, and the different local governments. It's still part of government. And procurement here, I'll simply define it as uh, obtaining goods and services or works so as to achieve certain uh, need. Uh, usually procurement refers to the final act of purchasing, but uh, in government, look at it at, as an overall, as a, uh, as a cycle, from, from, right from the intention, creating the intention up to the end of when you have gotten the uh, purchase, when you have made the final purchasing decision. So that's what, that's all is that called procurement, all, all that cycle is called procurement. And business, uh, I look at it as a commercial activity carried out, carried out by one to and from. It could be a company, it could be an individual, it could be a group of individuals, a partnership. And what is positioning? This is basically setting yourself, uh, being ready and standing up, ready to take an opportunity. So what does government procure? Government procures several things. Uh, there are goods, works, and services, and also the other non-consultant services. Uh, for example, goods could be books, that's be for schools, could be cars, food, uh, for example, uh, food for prisons, uh, food for the, for the different schools, food for uh, like police, scholastic materials for the schools, it could be seeds, could be holes, could be seedlings, uniforms, sanitizers. They're very, they're very 
basically they, they, it's, it's wide. I'm just giving you an example. And then works. We have roads, buildings, water, and general construction. Then services. Services could be training services, security, legal services, cleaning services, hotel services, engineering services, and then the other non-consultancy services. For example, we have the EPCs. Uh, government procures uh, a property which, which they, they, they hire and, and uh, that's, that is rental of, uh, rental of, of real, real estate property. Uh, the procurement in Uganda is governed by the PPDA Act, which was enacted in 2003. Along with came the, uh, the establishment of PPDA authority as the public procurement disposal or public asset authority, which, whose mandate is supposed to meet to formulate policies and regulations and build capacity and supervise the different PDEs. PDEs are the different procurement dispo and disposal entities. That is the different MDAs the ministries, the agencies, and the local governments, and also does auditing of the procurement compliance. And in today, you need to know that over 80% of public procurement is subject to open competition. Please note this, over 80% of public procurement is subject to open competition. Uh, if, if you look at the, the budget of Uganda, the current budget of Uganda for 2021-2022, financial year 2021-2022, is about 44.7 trillion. So about 50% of this, which is about 23, 22.35, is up for procurement. And about 80% of 22.3, which is, let's say about 22 trillion, is up for open competition. Meaning that you and I have a chance. If you are providers, if you are for services, for works and different organizations, you have a chance to participate. And this is up to open competition. The 20% could be direct procurement, maybe not, not competition, or maybe what you call single sourcing, but 80% of it is up to open procurement, open competitive bidding. So this is where you stand a chance and that's where the opportunity lies. Uh, the principles of, of uh, public procurement, uh, the several principles are there. One of them is openness. As you note, this is government money, this is taxpayers' money. You and I are taxpayers. So there is need openness, there's transparency, there's provision of equal opportunity to different players. Then there's a need to seek for value for money. This is taxpayers' money. So whatever government buys, they need to have value for money in that procurement. And hence, that's why the, often, oftentimes, there's these open procurement methods for most of the procurement. Like I said, 80% of public procurement is up to open competition. And how do you look for these opportunities? Uh, if, for example, you are uh, you go, rare goods, you need to have intuition who could be a possible customer. If, for example, you're a contractor, there's that market knowledge who could be a possible customer. It could be a minister of water, it could be an agency doing some construction or renovation. So there's that intuition and knowledge you need to have as a person of who could be your possible customers. Then there are several adverts in newspapers. Uh, this is especially for open domestic bidding. And I know our, our local newspapers, especially the daily ones, the New Vision and the Monitor, they have uh, days, I think Wednesdays and Thursdays, which is dedicated to adverts, mostly from these uh, MDAs and the, the rest of the general public. So you need to search out for an opportunity. Then there are adverts which are placed in international journals, that is for international bidding. And then you have websites on uh, different MDAs, different ministries, departments and agencies. Most of these agencies have uh, websites. For example, most of these ministries, I think it's ministry has a website. Uh, different local governments will have websites on which they advertise opportunities. And then there's the government standard portal called the government procurement portal. This is relatively new. Some may know, but it's relatively new. It's where they advertise opportunities. Then of course, newspaper websites and, and in some local governments and even some agencies, they put some of these opportunities on their notes boards. Uh, the government standard portal, the GPP, government procurement portal, was launched in 2015. The idea and the motive is to provide a web portal for bid and all PDs to capture data at the different stages of procurement, from initiation through invitation of bids, that is, through evaluation, uh, submission of uh, basic evaluated bidder notices, to contract signing until when the project is closed off. Uh, it's a web-based 
procurement platform and aims for this is a web-based procurement platform and aims promote efficiency and accountability in the public procurement. Uh, the portal contains the most recent information about government tenders from the different government departments and institutions across the country. Uh, when you get to access to this procurement portal, the GPP, you can search. It's a user-friendly portal. You can search for opportunities. It can help you filter through items of interest, such as procurement plans, uh, disposal plans, uh, notices, uh, invitation notices, a series of signed contracts, who has, who has advertised, who has won the contract, who where has it reached, has every time they have the contract, and also for suspended providers. Uh, sometimes some of these providers, suppliers of goods and services, they either misbehave or in lack of discipline, or sometimes they don't do the right thing. So the entity, the, the authority, which is the PPDA, suspends them. So if where an entity has been suspended, where a provider has been suspended, they're also listed on that portal. So information from this uh, includes, for example, procurement plans. Uh, this is not limited to this, but just to give an example. Uh, for example, this is some of the information information. As of uh, uh, like, like yesterday, there are about 223 entities which had listed the procurement plans. These are different departments, government agencies, and ministries which have listed their procurement plans. There are about 223 invitations from different entities. Then there are different number of BEB notices. Of course, these expire after some time. Then there are over 220 contracts signed. Entities which have signed contracts and with a whooping 87,000 contracts signed. I, I want you to know these numbers. These are contracts signed from 210 entities and the 87,000 contracts signed. All these are listed on the, on the procurement portal. And then, of course, uh, there's a register of providers. It would be of interest that everybody, every provider, every entity registers for, uh, for on this portal because some entities also use them to scan through when they're looking for whom to invite for bidding. And of course, I said, there are some suspended providers who are listed on the, on the, on the portal. Now, you need to know who procures for government. Government has different entities in which they, through which they procure. There's the central government. These are the ministries, Minister of Labor, Minister of uh, Energy, Minister of Works, Minister of uh, uh, Water and Environment. These are entities which send out invitation for bids. So governments procure through some of the ministries. Then there are departments. Then there are agencies. Then there are local governments. I think we've we've lost we've lost you, engineer. Ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me? I think we've uh, engineer Julius. Can you hear me? Okay, let's. Let, let, uh, I think he's being fixed, and he will be. He will. He should be back shortly. Okay, um, engineer Julius should be coming on shortly. He's being, uh, his, his machine is being fixed and he should be back on air shortly.
apologies. Let apologies. We a bit of an internet problem, but uh, engineer Judah should be on in the next one minute. Hello? Uh, so, sorry about the connectivity. Sorry about the connectivity. Uh, Uh, thank you. Sorry about that connectivity, but uh, we're good to go. Yeah. Like I said, I was talking about uh, using the web portal. Many government agencies advertise opportunities on these web portals. And it's up to you as a provider to seek some of these opportunities from the web portals. I'll give an example. Entities like, uh, like NSSF entities like uh, KCCA. These are some of the entities which have now been, uh, been piloted on the EGP. This is a, the electronic government portal of the government, which, which has been piloted in different entities and is now being used as, as a pilot in those different entities. With the advance of technology, Government rolled out the electronic government procurement portal on the 1st of July, 2021. Uh, the EGP is a web-based portal used to, used to carry out public procurement and disposal. Uh, it uses information and communication technology to conduct end-to-end -end government procurement and disposal processes online. All the stages right from procurement planning, bidding, evaluation, award, Contract management, invoicing, and paying for supplies is basically done out on the web, on the web portal and can be easily followed up. Uh, as of uh, yesterday or today, 11 entities, including NSSF, KC, and, and CAA, have been piloted on the web portal. Information provided on this web portal includes uh, one, the number of entities which are registered on the portal, about 407. 
the procurement plans for these entities are being provided. The bid notices, the over 17 bid notices, there are BEB notices, that these are basic evaluated bid notices. There's a list of contract awards. There's a list of contract awards and there's a list of suppliers. It's, not, it's, it's worth noting that over 200 and, at over 200 and 2,607 entities have been registered on this web portal. I'll, I'll give an extract from uh, an NSF procurement plan, which is displayed on the EGP. As a provider, when you get to this web portal, what do you want? For example, note that NSF has provisions for air tickets. This financial year, they intend to procure air tickets worth 410 million. If you look at uh, line number 70, the rescaling program, and this is like training, NSF intends to procure 150 worth. 150 million worth of reskilling. This is an opportunity as a provider you, you need to look out for. One of them is could be, how do I get in there? You need to get in there, for example, by uh, being pre-qualified, being on, being on the list of pre-qualified providers. As you notice, the total intended procurement for this financial is about 300, 314 billion. These are recurrent expenditures. These are recurrent procurements, which the entity intends to procure this year. And perhaps next year, almost an equivalent amount will be there for them. Now, what are the requirements for doing business with government? One, be a registered entity. It's very, government is very interested in doing business with registered entities. It could be a limited company. Uh, you can register with the RSB or its equivalent, that is in Uganda. You, so that you register, have articles association and memoranda. You could be a partnership, like lawyers use partnerships. You need to be tax registered. Because government money is collected from taxes pay, for example, VAT, pay as you earn, import tax. So you need to be registered as a tax as, as, as a, a tax taxpayer if you have to do government with business, if you have to do business with government. Then be tax compliant. In Uganda, most, taxes, uh, most tax returns are filed, filed every end of month. So make sure that you are consistent in filing your taxes. Then pay a trading license with the local authority. It could be, for example, KCC, it could be Wakiso, or the local authority, maybe Mbale, Mbale District Local Government. And then comply with the labor laws, such as NSSF. For if you have more than five employees, it's better to register with NSSF. If you have none, you can still register, but notify that you actually are a small company a small organization, and you have less than uh, the required number of entities for, for registration. Also, to transact with government, you need to have the person transacting or sending off the papers needs to be authorized by the firm that is with the powers of attorney. It shouldn't be solvent or bankrupt, and of course, not suspended by the authority. And make sure there's no conflict of interest. Don't procure or don't try to procure where you have an interest. For example, if you're a government worker and try to do business with the entity you're you you working with, have an office which is registered. And uh, in some cases, of course, or in all cases, there's some experience, level experience, which is required. And this differs depending on the kind of item you're being, uh, you, you are soliciting for. So the key, position, the key question is how do you position yourself for doing government business? One is you need to seek relevant information. Look out for bids, for bids invitation. I don't know, I listed the areas in which you can look out for the listing of invitations for bids. You examine the procurement plan of entities. You secure the key documentation in time. For example, don't wait to, to wait, don't wait to, until when an agent advises for a bid and you start looking for trading license or you start looking for registration of a company. And then you can also follow budget plans and proposals. Government of Uganda, of course, every year uh, announces, reads out a budget, and there's always a direction the government is taking. It could be infrastructure, it could be value addition to, 
to different, uh, maybe to crops or different uh, agricultural products. So look out for such, such ideas and then to, to inform you on how to position yourself. How you can position yourself for business opportunity. As a startup, there are different ways you can uh, position yourself. One, you can seek partnerships. If, for example, a construction company and, and uh, there's a job for which you think you don't have enough uh, capacity, seek partnerships. Two local firms can seek partnerships and, and, and bid for the work. Or an agency or a franchise. You can be an agency of an international company. Uh, you can uh, get, get, get pre-qualified for businesses. Uh, this is one of the biggest areas. I think most of the contracts awarded are given out to pre-qualified businesses. I'm going to explain much later, but how do you pre-qualify? Still, agencies advertise for pre-qualification of different, uh, different uh, services, works, goods, and services, usually done every three years. And then during that time of three years, goods, works, and services below the southern threshold are done, are awarded, or are given out to just pre-qualified agencies. Then you also need to, to study and understand the procurement process and, and bidding. For example, now government is introduced, has introduced the EGP, Electronic Government Procurement Portal. So all the server, all, all provide, service providers are encouraged to register on that platform. Go and look out for opportunities. Uh, I need to be ready for, for, for business. If, for example, you are, you are seeking to rent out property to a government agency, we need to have a certificate of occupation. All, uh, all housing after it's constructed and uh, you, before you move into the, 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 the building, you need to have a certificate of occupation. So when the government is trying to, is seeking to hire your, your building, this is something you're going to look out for. It takes a while to, to, to get this kind of documentation. So if, you, if that's your business, then make sure that you have it. For example, traders in Casita, there are so many buildings around here, but so many of them may not have a certificate of occupation. If that's your business, go look out for it because it may take me about two or, two or three months. That is if you have approved plans, sometimes you may need to structure integrity of the building before you can get that authority to house offices or, or maybe accommodation. Then for, for providers, uh, maybe man, uh, suppliers of, of, of equipment, you need manufacturers, certificate of manufacturer's authorization. Uh, maybe certificate of origin from manufacturers. These are some of the documents which take time. So have them ready and then and they can be valid for a number of years. Then allow for certification of goods, works, and services. I'll give an example. If you're supplying sanitizer, you need to have uh, NBS standards. Uh, you need to meet NBS standards and have NBS approved your sanitizer. The other standards to meet, for example, ISO, NDA, uh, NEMA standards for different uh, goods and services. No, no, no institution will come and uh, buy your sanitizer or, or your drugs if you're not licensed by NDA. Or if you're selling uh, steel, uh, for example, roofings, must have uh, a university approval certification that the goods are safe and worth, and what they sell to you is actually what they make. When they give a standard certification by UNBS, it means that they've been tested and what you, what you, what you produce is actually what is acceptable. So understanding the procurement methods used by government is key to positioning yourself. There's direct procurement, micro procurement. Direct procurement is usually straight to the past to the supplier. Micro procurement is for uh, for, for small items below 5 million. Say. Request for quotation, these are usually items uh, like for works, could be about below 200 million. Uh, you look for through the list of pre qualified contractors and, and see whom to invite to bid for that. Also, restricted procurement. Uh, this is about below 500 million, like for works. Uh, then, open domestic bidding. For, for when you have an estimate of items above 500, 500 million for works, then you open it up to the public. Uh, that's where uh, people uh, are invited for bids in the papers or on the website, and people compete. Then, of course, you have open international bidding and restricted international bidding. This is advertising on international journals. 
usually for services which may not be readily available in Uganda, or where maybe the providers are few and you want to invite uh, a, a sizable number of, of, of uh, bidders to have competition. The bidding methods are in line with the thresholds. The thresholds are the amount based on pre-bid pre, pre estimates. For every time there's a, a bid, you make pre-bid estimates, and the pre-bid estimate guides you on how much you're going to, on how much, on what kind of method you're going to use in the procurement. And the, and the thresholds vary from uh, central government, local government, even the embassies, and they also vary for goods, works, and services. For example, for supplies and non-consultancy services, the procurement method used uh, depends on, uh, on the threshold. For open bidding, we have more than 200 million. When the estimate is more than 200 million, that's when you see, paper, you see the, the invitations in the papers. But when the estimate of the service is between 100 and 200 million, we have restricted bidding. That means they look out for providers who are on the pre-qualified list, or providers who are registered with, the, with PPDA on the government portal or the EGP. Uh, for request of quotations, that is between uh, that is for services, supplies and unconcerned services, that's between five and hundred million. Also look out for providers who are shortlisted on the pre-qualified on the list. That is between five and hundred million. And micro procurement, usually these are below five, five million. You just pick a few uh, sub supplies that they give you quotation and and, and you pick the best amongst it the ones that provide the quotations. The threshold is for works. Uh, for open bidding, we have when it's above 500 million. Uh, restricted bidding mean when, when you have an estimate between 200 and 500 million. And, and I want to dwell a bit on this. Uh, most local governments are, and, and save of the, or, or the central governments, this is one area where most of the contracts will fall between 200 and 500 million. Who benefits are the ones who are, the ones who are uh, pre-qualified or the ones who are on the list of uh, providers with the, with the authority. So you, you find that for every advert that goes out in the open domestic BD, about six of them have, been, have gone out to restricted bidders. So if you do not shortlist your company or your entity, you get to miss out because you are not given opportunity as much as those who are shortlisted. Uh, the request for quotation is, is uh, usually between 10 to 200 million, and then micro procurement below uh, to 10 million. Uh, of course, along with this, there comes the, 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 the period for bidding reduces. Uh, that, that would be, of course, uh, a different subject, but uh, each, each, each bidding period has got uh, a time in which it applies. Then consultant services, uh, request for proposal with expression of interest, UI, usually that's when it's above 200 million, and request for proposals without expression of interest, that's uh, between 50 and uh, 200 million. Also, government procures individual consultants, where the value of consultancy required is less than 50 million. They can uh, seek an individual, like, uh, for example, Mr. Peter, you ex an expert in environmental impact assessment, uh, maybe a few of them, and they compete and they can. And they, and, and they can procure them directly. So what is a procurement cycle like? Uh, it starts from uh, procurement planning uh, to the requirement definition, tender sourcing, evaluation and selection, contract award, and contract management. To best understand the, the procurement cycle, you need to look at uh, what happens at the evaluation stage. As, as a bidder, you need to be interested because this is like a marking scheme. Evaluation is like a marking. We say we want this, are you providing it? And, and it's, a little bit, it's a little bit easier than, for example, exams done in class because yeah, it's open, open book. What you want, you have all the time, you, you can consult, you can use whoever you want. It's not restricted. You can use a professional, you can use somebody to help you out. So when you're preparing bids, one, read the instructions carefully. Follow out the laid out requirements in the bid. For example, if you want bid security of how much, 
what form? Is it a bid guarantee or is, or, or is it, a, or, or is it a, an insurance guarantee? Is it a bank guarantee or insurance guarantee? The bid validity, how long is, it, is the bid going to be valid? Uh, if you have if you require audit books of accounts, for how many years are the audit books of accounts required? If they say five years, don't submit for only two. There's a purpose behind every information requested for. For example, if you ask for audited books of accounts for five years, it means the entity wants to see how have you been managing your businesses. Is the business a growing concern? A growing concern? Are you growing in profitability? How, what are your ratios? The profitability ratios, the, the, your debt ratios, the liquidity ratios. Do you have money? Are you indebted? Are you spending so much on equipment and don't have money to spend on, uh, on the construction? And then the key to this bid preparation is submit on time. Must submit on time. When they say 10 a.m., it's not five minutes past 10. Five minutes past 10 means you're late. Uh, seek clarification if necessary. Uh, the end studio allows for class seeking clarifications. Uh, and then seek technical, technical input when necessary. By technical input, I mean you can, for example, if you're preparing bids for consultants, there's a methodology which you need to write. It's a technical input. So get somebody who's skilled in writing methodology, or if it is a, a bid for works, get somebody who's skilled in preparing a bid for works and get, and get you through. You could even have a, a one of training and because once you did it once or twice, then you get to some other thing and it becomes a lot easier than you may think. Uh, like I said, to understand the, uh, the procurement process, you need to very much understand the evaluation process because it is what, it is, this is what examines what you submit. Uh, Uh, most evaluation processes are in about three stages. Uh, there's, uh, which is the first one, which is the preliminary evaluation. The second one is the technical, and the third is the financial. Uh, there could be a, sometimes a, a combination of uh, weighted points in different things, but principally these are the three evaluation stages. So the first evaluation stage is about the legal issues about the company. Is the company registered? Is it a legal entity? Is it in existence? For example, uh, where is it registered? Is it registered in Uganda, in Kenya, or where, where is it registered? Are they tax registered? Remember, you're abusing uh, taxpayers' money. So you need to ensure that even as you do business, you are tax, tax registered and you're tax compliant. Do they have trading license? Is the local authority are they, are they paying trading license to the local authorities? If the business is, is uh, based in Gulu, are they paying, paying trading license to, to Gulu district law government? Uh, are they compliant with labor laws? Uh, are they insolvent or bankrupt? And they shouldn't be conflict of interest. So these are some of the items which you look at at the first preliminary stage. For you to pass on to the next stage, you must first fully past the preliminary stage. And these are quite uh, not so hard for, for an entity to, 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 to pass. But sometimes you find that providers concentrating so much on the pricing and forgetting the basics. Once you know that, before you get to the third stage of financial evaluation, you must pass the first stage of preliminary evaluation and the second stage of technical evaluation. It calls you to pay more attention in the basics, the preliminary evaluation requirements as listed above. The second stage now, this is your technical evaluation stage. Uh, at this point, we want now to go technical. Do you have experience? What have you been doing in the last five years or three years? Do you have certificates of completion for the works you, you are saying you are doing? Do you have certificates of recommendation letters? If you say you've been supplying goods to NADS, has NADS given you recommendation letters? Have they uh, given you certificates of, of compliance? Uh, and what, what are the values of the works you've done? Here I dig deeper into the financial capacity. Uh, for many of the services, you find you need the uh, extra capital. Can you get access to credit from your bankers? Can you, can you demonstrate that you actually can get access to credit to mat for, for materials from your suppliers? For example, if you go to the world, can they say we shall supply you goods worth 200 million or 20 million so that you can use them for performance of the contract. Uh, then the personnel, uh, as you know, things are done by people. 
if, if for example, it is a, a construction building, we need to know who are you going to use? We've had issues of buildings collapsing. We've had issues of, uh, uh, if it's medical services, it's a hospital and, and, and you are applying for registration as a service provider for health services. Do you have the doctors? How many do you have on board? How many do you have on call? What are your years of experience? Do you have, for example, an oncologist? Do you have, for example, a pediatrician? Do you have uh, the kind of uh, individuals you want? These, of course, the requirements will be listed. Uh, academic requirements required will be listed. The professional registration with the different professional bodies, for example, the doctors, the engineers, the surveyors, they will be listed. All you have to do is look for people who meet the requirements. If it is construction, we look out for equipment. And this is very key in, uh, for those who are involved in construction. You don't have to own all the equipment, but you can hire or lease for the time you're going to the works. Most of the contractors you find themselves that in, in starting, they're putting so much money in buying equipment, when actually they're going to use it for uh, a short while. Uh, they, maybe they divert, they divert uh, advanced, advanced payment to buying, buying equipment. At the end of the day, you find they don't have money to do the works, which is the primary aim of the procurement. So as a startup, we need to know that one, you can hire equipment, you can own it, or, but you can also can lease it. What is key is go to the one who is, whom you are going, who is going to lease the equipment, have an arrangement, have an agreement that so and so will lease me this equipment and demonstrate that actually so and so owns the equipment. This could be in the form of logbooks. If, for example, you go to companies like, uh, well, I won't mention, but uh, there are several companies which hire equipment in Uganda. Let them write you formally that we shall hire this equipment to this person and this and this for this time for performance of the contract. So that you don't necessarily have to type all your money in the equipment. But of course, ownership is good as you grow up. Then there are the special licenses for doing certain works. For example, if you are doing high altitude, like cleaning of buildings, for example, like if you're going to do cleaning of NSF building, there are certain licenses for the cleaners who, who must do certain cleaning at, at certain altitudes, at certain trainings. So some of them is doing them. Then, of course, you need audit books of accounts. Yeah, you demonstrate your turnover, your profitability. If you are making losses, you also need to know that. And the idea is to know that you are going concern for the time of the procurement. And then the methodology of doing the work should be demonstrated. This is why you need professionals come in and help you do methodology. Uh, methodology is key because if your methodology for, for building a road is different from methodology for constructing a building. And of course, everything must have a work plan so that it conforms to requirements. Uh, a project is, has a, a, a limited time, you start and end date. Uh, an entity procures a, a building so that it can use it for certain work. So if you want it for two years, uh, you need to demonstrate that actually you're able to perform and deliver the building within the time allocated. Then once you've passed the preliminary and technical stage, that's when you go to the financial evaluation. At here, of course, they'll do arithmetic checks to ensure that uh, you are, your math is right, your arithmetic is right. And then that uh, it's at this point that the lowest evaluated bidder is recommended for evaluation. I hope you get it very clearly. It's not that the, the lowest bidder gets to be awarded the contract, but the, but the lowest of the, of the ones who are compliant from the technical, the financial, and the evaluation, and the technical, primary, and the financial stages is one who gets a contract, which is, that's why you could have a term called best evaluated bidder, but not lowest bidder. And of course, you need to know that entities do carry out due diligence. At, to, to confirm that uh, information supplied is correct and truthful. They'll come to your offices, they'll come to your, if you say you're getting equipment from somewhere, they'll go there and visit and see whether the lease has actually the equipment that you are claiming they have. And of course, submission of uh, correct information can lead to uh, uh, suspension, disqualification uh, from the public bidding for maybe a couple of years or even months. What are the challenges we have in public procurement? One of the biggest challenges we have in public procurement is a lack of capacity, liquidity mainly. Cash flow is very important to doing works, especially for contractors, for suppliers, and for, for suppliers and, and providers of services. Uh, if, for example, you're supplying items, food rations to a certain entity, 
may find that they pay every quarter. So meaning that within the, the month of the of that of the of quarter preceding, you need to have cash flow to guarantee this to guarantee the supplies required. If you are doing construction, usually you need to hand in a uh, submit in a claim which is substantial. So after you've even handed in this, the claim for, for 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 payment before it is satisfied and paid, you expect it to continue doing work. That's why you request you to get guarantees or get uh, credit from the banks or from material suppliers so that you can be able to do the work while you are waiting for payment. So the lack of capacity is very challenging for several contractors. Uh, some have limited cash flows. And then the other problem is diversion of money to non-contractual activities. This is very key. Oftentimes, uh, contractors and suppliers get adverse payments, so about 20-30%. But you find the contractor on getting at the payment diverts the money to maybe buying cars, buying equipment. It could be necessary for the, for the project. But if you don't have the capacity to perform the contract at the end, you don't have to buy equipment. You can lease it. Uh, and then aiming beyond reach. You need to know where do you start from as you grow. That's why you also request for experience for contractors. Uh, Then inability to keep time schedules. So in most cases, you have time overruns. You find the contract is supposed to be run for one year, but uh, because of weather and seriousness, or maybe because of uh, not that inbuilt system of we must meet time, uh, the contractors or suppliers are not uh, keeping time. If, for example, you are supposed to provide meals to an entity, maybe a banking agency, or maybe a bank, or maybe to an entity, you need to mark the time. What time do they, do they have lunch? Is it between one and three? So have that in place. Uh, if they are going to supply goods, let's say, let me give an example of supplying food to UPDF and they have uh, an operation to do. You must keep time. You, you can't say I'm supplying food at the time when they're already into operational zones. You must keep time to be, be, be there, checked, tested, certified, perhaps packed, in order for them to be ready to use it and give it to the full soldiers when they're going for an operation. So when you are unable to keep time, that, is, uh, that goes to the root of the contract and can lead to termination of the contract. And lead, if you are in, in construction, for example, and, or you maybe uh, supplies and you're supplying equipment, they say generators and you're putting them. Oftentimes, uh, we have challenges with uh, suppliers failing to put certain items in time. Uh, uh, of course, right now there's, there's a, the COVID issue, but uh, if there's a COVID issue, plan ahead and see how, how to mitigate it. And the other issue is underquoting items. Oftentimes, suppliers want to, want to get into markets and they end up underquoting. For example, if you are underquoting for, uh, I'll give an example, if, if a square meter of, of tiles and you're putting uh, 30,000, and you know a square meter of just buying is going to be 35,000, then what about the labor, the materials used to, to put it right on, place it on the floor and other items? So sometimes you have challenges when they below market prices. So you end up uh, having people abandoning works or not being able to perform. Or sometimes they want to compromise the quality. Quality is very key in, 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 in this issue. Uh, procurement has three key deliverables. One, quality, cost, and time must deliver on quality, must deliver within the cost, value for money, and time. Those are the key main ones. Of course, there are others, but those are the key main ones. So when you have quality issues, the remedy is to issue to, to either, is to instruct you to do reworks or rejected supplies. There's a case, a recent example of, um, of, of uh, blankets in somewhere. Uh, there have been cases of uh, holes and uh, pangas where people have supplied materials which are of less desirable quality than, than required. How do you mark quality? Quality is specified in the procurement. If, for example, you specify a tile, a tile will be a certain size, a tile will be a certain thickness, a tile will be satisfied by UNBS or ISO. That's defining quality. If it's, for example, for goats, I can give you an example, a goat will be a certain height not less than a certain number of kilograms. 
and maybe a certain breed is required. So if you don't meet that requirement, then you're not meeting quality. Uh, if, for example, it's services, we need services delivered by a certain person, should have a certain experience, should have certain skills, should have uh, uh, certain years of experience, skills, and training. Yeah. Then the other issue we have often, oftentimes is lack of uh, personnel and, and, and equipment. Uh, if you bid and you've indicated you're going to have different personnel for, for performance of certain works, please avail them when the time comes. Don't just put them on the book and when the time comes, they're not available to perform the works. And, uh, and then uh, the equipment. Uh, for example, if you're going to do road works, if you're going to do uh, putting maram and compacting, it's an activity which can hardly be done by, can be done by labor, but depending on the extent, you, you can take maybe a year or when certain activity could be taking weeks to do. So you need equipment to do, do the certain things. So when, when, you, when such time comes, please, when you have equipment, deliver it on time, because the rates provided are usually enough for hiring equipment which can be used for such items. And the other challenge, yeah. So those are some of the challenges mainly met in, the, in this public procurement. Then another thing which I want um, is as about the capacity, being a, being a, a good judge of oneself. If you've been doing works for, for example, 500 million, how do you move to the next stage? Oftentimes, people have, companies have collapsed when they try to move way ahead of their schedule, way ahead of what they can, their capacity. If you've been doing works for 200 million, if you start to do works 100, 200 million, and now you've moved to a capacity of 500 to maybe 300, 500 million, the next time you move to 1 billion and above, you need to develop capacity over time. Oftentimes, when people go for higher capacity than they can meet, they end up getting challenges. And these are reasons why. For example, for government contracts, you need a uh, performance. You need, first of all, you need uh, a bid guarantee. A bid guarantee that will maybe satisfy 5 million, which is usually about 2% of the, of the estimate. After, bid, after getting the contract, after you've won the contract, they need a performance security. The performance security is about 10%, usually by bank guarantee. Oftentimes, banks will say, we want a cash cover for the performance security. Or sometimes they can give you, depending on relationship with the banks, they can give you half percent, uh, maybe 50-50, 50% cover of the, of the security. And then you also need an advanced payment guarantee, which is about 20% of the contract. So all these guarantees require that you have cash or you have property, which you can give to the banks so, so that they can give you that cover. It's, it's worth noting that, for example, if you don't have performance security, then the payment will not be made to you. So much as you're able to work, but you cannot get paid because you don't have performance security. This is what happens in the long run, you're unable to perform. Uh, it's also good to note that uh, some of these banks right now are, are, are coming up to, are, are, are tailoring certain, certain packages for contractors and suppliers and of services and, and, and goods. Oftentimes, they'll, they'll give you credit limits, establish credit limits with your, with your banks, for example, and have, have, have limits, maybe 1.8 billion within which and have limits in which you can operate. Thank you. Uh, now, the other, the other challenge uh, I'm going to talk about is delayed payments by, by entities, which you need to note as a supplier. We need to do some small research, know who you are, who your customer is as a supplier? Who, is it a government entity? Do they have do, you, do they have their own money? Do they generate money internally? Do they depend on uh, consolidated fund allocations? Do they so different and government entities pay differently? And it's also good to have it in mind as you plan. For example, if you are paying for every every, every quarter release, then planning plan in such a way that you plan to expect money every uh, quarter. And then sometimes, of course, you have uh, challenges by entities when they have scope creep. You find they need more than actually uh, their needs exceed what they have they are, they are, they are done before. So end up overshooting their budgets and overshooting the, uh, the scope. 
Then some entities, of course, issue informal instructions, which sometimes are very hard to pay for. Uh, and also, of course, for the roughly contracts. So as, as an entity, you need to read through a contract. Uh, for example, there could be an element of payment will be done once the contract is done. This is a negotiable item. You can negotiate you know, every uh, certain milestone, or maybe every month or every quarter or uh, every time a claim is submitted. Uh, but also need to know that the government operates cash budgets and sometimes have budget cuts. So as a contractor, you need to have that in mind. It can be a challenge, but it's something you can plan for uh, as you uh, as you as you bid for, for certain for certain works. All these build into the costs. For example, if you are paying me weekly and you're paying me monthly or maybe uh, every quarter, the cost will be different depending on the service provided. Uh, what are the opportunities for, for providers, Ugandan providers? Government has provided what you call a preference scheme, a margin of preference. This is basically to advantage Ugandan suppliers, contractors, over foreign suppliers and contractors when it comes to some of these items. For example, we know like a cost of sugar imported from Brazil could be cheaper in Uganda, much as you produce sugar. So when such a procurement comes up, it's what you call a margin of preference. How it operates is that they will add, once you've succeeded through the different stages of evaluation and they've reached the financial level, financial stage, they'll add what you call a margin of preference, about 15% over the foreign supplier for example, he quoted 1 billion and you quoted 1.1. They'll add 15% over the foreign supplier from 1 billion to make it about 1.15. So as a Ugandan supplier, there you will pass because eventually the evaluated price will be 1.1 when the foreign supplier's price will be about 1.15. Of course, your contract will still stay 1.1, but in terms of evaluation, this is done to advantage you as a local supplier. This is intended to promote a local industry and local suppliers and advantage them over foreign suppliers. For good, for, 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 for construction works, it's about 7%. Uh, of course, many people have been complaining about uh, how governments maybe sometimes then doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't care for them, but some of them is just because they don't have that information. This is a marginal preference. Uh, uh, this is added to, for companies which are one, it must be locally registered and with over 50% shareholding owned by Ugandans. That's when you benefit from uh, margin of preference. Uh, I'm going to repeat this. Margin of preference will benefit one, local registered companies, and those companies which have over than 50% of shareholding owned by local Ugandans. Uh, to prove this, of course, we shall require maybe proof of uh, national ID, uh, uh, certificate of registration as a citizen, or maybe passport to prove that actually Ugandan. And also this applies to joint, joint ventures. A joint ventures, when you have a joint venture and the lead joint venture is a, is a local company, they also can benefit from budget of preference. Yeah. So in conclusion, I say one, government is the biggest employer in Uganda and it's far reaching in all different sectors of the economy. It has a big recurring expenditure meaning that every financial year, government is going to procure. Over 80% of our procurement is going to be open. Over 22 point something billion, trillion, is going to be available for procurement every financial year going forward. So you need to identify your niche, uh, your need, and what's all well, you need that needs to be filled, and aim to start slow if you're a starter and grow progressively into this uh, supply and uh, contracting business. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Thank you very much, Engineer Julius Taewa. That was an excellent, excellent presentation, very informative. And I believe that uh, the entrepreneurs attending have picked a lot of lessons. Personally, I think this was excellent because what you clearly highlight here is that government procures a lot from, from, from the pub public and private sector. And so there are a lot of opportunities presented, definitely. With 50% of our budget being spent on public procurement, I think that there's a space for everybody. I also like the fact that you said that uh, 
And most of this 80% of procurement is actually open for competition. I think there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, pro information circulating, uh, saying pro public procurement is a waste of time, it's complicated, there's corruption, but clearly, from the procedures you've stated, it is actually a very transparent process and would like to urge our, our entrepreneurs to actually participate. What you emphasize here, though, is you need to be registered. So I think pre-qualification, and that's very important. You probably, Julius, you later tell us how, we how to get registered on the portal. That may be something that uh, our entrepreneurs need to know. Clearly, to position ourselves, because today, uh, Julius was talking about how to position your small business. And I think clearly here, compliance is very important. Forming partnerships. Sometimes we can't work alone, but when we, are to, when we, when we, we join forces, we become stronger, we are bigger, and we are more eligible. We need to get pre-qualified, but also we need to understand the procurement process. And that's why today we brought you this presentation because we know this is an area that uh, many of you are missing out on, not because you, you don't have capacity, but probably you don't have a, a very good understanding. And so getting knowledge about the procurement process is very critical. And then you've emphasized the issue of quality, quality, quality. But also I see so many opportunities at, uh, at, at central government, but also most importantly at local government where many of us operate. So entrepreneurs, we need to plug in, we need to get pre-qualified, we need to network. And I like the margin of pre preference that you've talked about. And so I think that uh, you see that government is making every effort to have inclusive growth, to ensure that the private sector at all levels is actually involved. So this margin of preference is available for us to give us an advantage over the others. So I really want to thank you very much. Uh, this was an excellent presentation, Engineer Julius. If, we, if, if it was live, I would have asked participants to put their hands together for you. Thank you so much. Yes, so now we are going to go to the next stage of our, of our, of our time together. And so questions. I'd like us to ask questions, uh, put up your hand and, uh, and, and mute your microphone and keep your question very brief and specific. But also, you can also post your question in the chat room. I'll be able to capture that and make sure that uh, Engineer Julius responds to all the questions. Okay, so any hands up? Um, okay, J J Junior Niwandinda, your hand is up. Please go ahead. Unmute. And uh, good morning, and uh, good morning, and thank you for this presentation. I have a question. Uh, most times, most of these government MDAs ask for experience, uh, and which is lacking in uh, some of our new coming up uh, companies. Let's say like uh, me, I registered my company uh, rate last year. And then when you try to source for these things, then they tell you we need audited accounts for three years, we need experience for whatever, we need this. Uh, and you're just starting and you're looking for what to think. So I don't know how us, we can also get into the mix and be involved. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Uh, among Alex, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, I will want to thank Mr. Julius for the presentation, but as well wanted to know that uh, what has the local government done what has the local government done to increase the confidential uh, the confidence to the public for the private sector that when we apply for these bids that there is no conflict of interest between the um, the people who are in charge or responsible of awarding the bids especially in case they have their relatives who might be bidding the same same thing with us as well how are we confident that uh, we are we are we are going to get this bid through without corruption and other issues thank you mm. Thank you very much, Alex. For that's a very good question as well. Let's have uh, Osbat Arinaitwe. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, how do reservation and uh, preference schemes work? And uh, works and uh, 
what is this process? Because uh, I've met it several times. I would mm. wish to know more about it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. We'll take another question from Nixon Kasisi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, the presenter, Julius. Uh, my question is, uh, he mentioned that about the manufacturer's authorization. What happens, you know, the manufacturer's authorization is usually, these manufacturers give it to one person when the bidding process is on. What happens if that person who has given the manufacturer's authorization does not satisfy the other requirements and therefore is not awarded the tender? Uh, what happens then? Because I thought they would allow more, all people to put uh, to bring it, and uh, maybe it's something we can tell the manufacturers so that the playing ground is good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Nixon, for that question. I think those are four questions. And uh, Julius, there was a question that I asked: How does one get registered on the on the portal, on the government portal? So let's have Julius respond to those five questions. Then we'll take another round of questions, but also post any questions, uh, any comments in the chat. Thank you. Over to you, Julius. Uh, th thank you very much. Th thank you very much, Rosemary. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll start with uh, your question first. How do you register on the portal? Uh, first of all, I say this is a public portal, uh, the EGP portal, and then there's also the government procurement portal. So there are two portals running almost about, that, about the same time. One was established in 2015, and then the one which was established, the EGP port, which has been established this year. Because of technology, government is also transforming uh, to doing procurement online. Sooner or later, we shall be doing all procurement processes online. So to register one, you go to the, uh, uh, the website. If we have the PPD website, uh, then, then, then there is a registration of a providers. You can, you can register that. Uh, you can register as, 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 as a provider, you sign, you log in, and then they, they, they give you information. It basically, it's, it's user-friendly. Once you get a website, uh, www.ppda.go.ug, then there are leads. There are selections, and you can register as a provider. And then you can see who's registered, who's, uh, uh, who, which entity is registered, and you can get more information from that. There's a question from uh, Junior about MD, MDAs requiring experience. Yeah, this is true. Most MDAs require experience, uh, which is almost everywhere. Because if you're going to build a, your own house, for example, and you want a tailor, you want a tailor who has done some work because you have quality issues which you need to control. So how do you get experience? One, you can subcontract. Because you are not going to trust you with a, a job of 500 million when the biggest job you've done is, is only 50 million. But once you've done 200 or 300, then progressively you can build on to 500. So one of the things you can do is subcontract. If you know, for example, uh, Junior, has, Junior uh, has gotten a contract and it's worth 10 billion or maybe 1 billion of works. It could include tiling, it could include uh, electrical works, it could include mechanical works, but of which you're interested in, uh, in maybe, maybe in just a building works. Go as a subcontractor, engage him, the person, and do part of that. Uh, UNRWA, for example, is promoting the use of uh, subcontracting a certain percentage of works uh, for these big contracts. Most of these big contractors you see on doing the roads, they are supposed to subcontract some of those works. So you need to look for some of the opportunities and, and, and get there and do some sub and, and do subcontracting for works. Then that option is uh, going for partnerships. If you've been working locally and you've been working in a range of one to 500 million or one billion, and now the job requires uh, 10 billion, look for a, for a partnership. Look for a partner who has, for example, been working maybe outside the country or within the country. You get together, uh, Julius and maybe Junior, you get uh, you form a joint venture and then approach the, and then bid jointly as a joint venture. That way you can uh, learn experience, one, learn from each other but also use, you live, leverage on each other's experience and to create capacity. There's another question about uh, confidence building, especially in the local government, because there's lack of confidentiality and uh, about the process that maybe they could give out the jobs to their relatives. Yeah, this, this is a, a big challenge. I can't say I have all the answers, 
but it's, it really goes down to the root of our society. Uh, sometimes people will, will write down, uh, first of all, at the start of each procurement process, the evaluators are required to sign what you call a code of ethics, a network code of conduct form, declaring that they don't have conflict of interest in the procurement. So at that point, people are supposed to be honest and declare. Sometimes they may not. But then also, in the case of uh, conflict of interest and it's noticed, sometimes you can, you can uh, well, you can, you can raise it up to the, to the authorities, but this is really a behavior issue uh, which goes down to the society because we pick the members who are on those committees usually are from a society. So it really calls for change, change of, of uh, individual, individual discipline, at a, discipline at an individual level. But uh, going forward, uh, government, as I said, is, is moving towards e-procurement. With e-procurement, there's going to be less interaction of uh, everything what's what will be tracked. You can see when has it been evaluated, when has it evaluated, when has it, uh, when is it bid or not bid notice, when is it out. For example, I know in local government sometimes, they may not issue out a best of bid bidder notices. But right now with e-procurement, e e then you can tell, for example, the notice has been issued out by just checking on the website. If you're registered or if you just go with us, just access the, the portal, you can check, for example, has been given out. So that one also kind of minimizes the, those, those uh, indiscipline cases that uh, we are talking about. Then there is uh, also but about reservation and preference schemes. Uh, a preference scheme is, uh, okay, this, this, that's when you have a margin of preference. Uh, I'll give you an example, which I had quoted before. A preference scheme, works by adding onto a foreign supplier a margin over and above their price. So that in, when, when they can qualify through all the entities, at the end of the day, their price will go slightly higher to a level which we think is not so much to stop them from, from uh, doing business. Uh, for works, it's about up to 7%. For goods, it's about 15%. And this works a, 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 preference, a reserve, uh, preference scheme uh, works in such a way that uh, you apply the margin of preference, you apply over and above their prices, you apply a percentage. If you're a Ugandan, if you're a Ugandan supplier contractor and you have bidded for, let's say, one billion as a price, that is after they've gone through all the stages, and the foreign bidder has bidded for one point. Um, uh, okay, you've bidded maybe, uh, let me give you an example. If you're, if you're a Ugandan supplier, you've bidded at 1.1. And the foreign supplier has, give, has bid it at 1 billion. So they add about 7% uh, over the foreign bidder's price, which may make it about 1.07. Uh, the Ghanaian bidder may be about 1.1. Uh, In that way, they try to advantage the, the, local, the local suppliers, Ugandan companies, Ugandan suppliers, so that they can compete at financial levels. The idea is that uh, some of these foreign companies can access capital a little bit cheaply. Uh, maybe they have more skills, they, have more, they are more capitalized. Uh, but of course, we want to maintain quality. So we can beat them by adding that margin of preference on top of their prices so that you are able to compete favorably. It cannot be so much because at the end of the day, don't make the procurement exclusive because certain things you may not provide you locally, but also don't make it uh, prohibitive so that you don't invite foreign suppliers from, from bidding. Then reservation scheme applies by, uh, this is where certain works, for example, could be reserved for certain communities. For example, an entity can say we are reserving a uh, uh, supply of, of, of now it can say we are reserving supply of goods to, to community groups, to organize community groups. In that way, only, those, only that kind of group is allowed to participate in that procurement. Uh, there have been cases of uh, roadworks where the, 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 the reservation is only for local people. For example, in, I mean, um, uh, routine maintenance works on roadworks. You find to apply for such works, or for example, for markets, to apply to run a market, there's always a requirement that you must be within a certain community. You must be there and know how their behaviors, know their culture, so that you can be able to apply for, for that activity. So that's, that's a reservation scheme, being targeted on a local community. But preference usually like works at, at national level. Then next one talks about uh, manufacturer authorization. Uh, different manufacturers, of course, have different agencies. And oftentimes, it's only that agency which they will allow to trade with. 
uh, from experience, I've seen several companies out, outside Uganda, they're a bit hesitant to come and do business locally. So oftentimes they look for an agent or an agent will approach them to, or somebody will approach them to take exclusive rights to operate within the region. What happens is that because it's limited to that person and the person has failed, in that case, maybe unfortunately, the person has failed to, to meet the requirements. So it's more, it's more important for them to, to, to take, take care of the other requirements, the technical issues, the preliminary issues, so that they do not fail. Otherwise, once they fail, then it's not transferable to the next person. Because manufacturer's authorization is really given to uh, import, maybe suppliers of equipment or vehicles, such that the entity is guaranteed that this entity, the one which is supplying or the supplier is given authority, uh, authority by the manufacturer to guarantee costs and that it's original from the manufacturer. So it's not easily transferable. So in this case, the entity, the, the supplier has to make sure that they pass other requirements. Otherwise, the, the manufacturer's authorization may not be transferable to other, other people to use it. Uh, thank you. That's it for now. I'll wait for more questions. Thank you very much, Julius. I think you've ably responded to those the, the, the five questions. Uh, we'll take another round of questions. Please put up your hand and I'll be able to pick you or post in the chat. Now, as we wait for members to put up their hands, there are some uh, there are three questions in the chat. And uh, um, we have one from Duncan. Duncan Ahigika says, is there a way electronically we can track this process to avoid face-to-face -face interactions and possible corruption? The second question from Junior Nuandinda, recently government introduced the EGP platform, which I thought would make the process easier and so reduce corruption. But I have noticed that it's just about eight government agencies registered now. This leaves a big gap for other agencies. And then the last comment question we have from Jen Nachiria. She says, uh, for clarification purposes, what's the difference between works, supplies, and service? So I think that Julius, you can respond to those. Clearly the issue of corruption seems to be quite an issue here. And so please, please, please respond to those as we wait for more questions and comments from, from members. Uh, th thank you, Rose, Rosemary. Uh, I'll start with Duncan's question. Is there a way how we can track these processes? Yes. That's why the government has introduced the EGP. The EGP allows you to track the procurement process from the, from the point of initiation, the point of uh, bid submission, uh, evaluation, uh, base evaluate bid notice, uh, contract signing, up until when that has been closed. And this can be accessed by going to the, to the AGP portal, which is available online. Two, Junior talks about uh, the AGPs being only in, in, in very few entities. Uh, what I can say is there's an intention to, to expand the number of, uh, the number of entities on, on, to the, on the AGP. Right now, we have about uh, 11 entities. Uh, key of them, for example, is the NSF, which is one of the biggest spenders in the economy. We have KCCA. Uh, we have civil aviation authority. Uh, this is also there are some of the big organizations. So this is under pilot. And uh, the idea is you pilot and see what are the challenges. Is it delivering the results required? Can it be monitored very well? And, and, and eventually all, all other entities, of course, will definitely be, be migrated and also captured on, in, in the long run. That's why I'm encouraging all suppliers and providers to register so they can, uh, 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 and, uh, they can benefit from, from, from this EGP. Uh, and in addition, the entities which have been piloted on the EGP, eh, people will be interested to take a look. In my presentation, I, 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 I brought out a scan of uh, information from NSSF to show you the procurement plan that NSSF is planning to spend 314 billion. That's a huge sum of money to be spent by one entity. And what are the services? Air ticketing, cleaning services, different things. Maintenance, ABC, FG. So as an entity, as a supplier, you'd be interested. For example, if these guys have this procurement plan, I might be qualified with them. How do I get this opportunity? Do I keep on looking at the, at the, at the entity so that every time a bid notice comes up, then I can be able to, to, uh, to bid for it? Uh, and then Jenina, I hope I get the name right, asked for a difference between works, services, and uh, goods. Uh, let me start. One, works is, uh, 
works mainly will include construction. Construction of roads, construction of buildings, uh, construction of water schemes. Basically, works is about mainly about construction. Services. I'll, I'll just give examples. Services, for example, like training, uh, hotel services, that is accommodation, uh, hiring of vehicles, um, uh, maybe legal services, consultancy services, services, for example, consultants to, to design a to study, to design something, all those are services. And then there is uh, then goods. For example, supply of motor vehicles, those are goods. Supply of food, supply of seedlings, supply of goats, supply of uh, uh, computers, supply of furniture, supply of... Uh, those, are, those are services. Those are, those are goods, rather. Those are goods. So goods are something you can usually touch, usually, for example, computers, you know, cabinets, uh, building materials, those are services. I think that's why, by bringing out examples, I hope you can kind of differentiate and tell what, what the different categories are, are grouped. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julius. Um, uh, I think that uh, uh, we, it's now 10.32. And so if there's no other burning question, I don't see any hand up. And the chat room, I think we've, we, we, I think we've oh, so Godfrey Chigwe has a question. Godfrey, please go, go ahead. You have the floor. Godfrey, please unmute. Was your hand up? Yes, your hand is up. Please unmute and Hello? ask your question. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, yes please. Hear you. Yes, thank you, Madam Rosemary, for the opportunity, and thank you, Julius, for the presentation. It was wonderful. You're welcome. So my question is um, about this procurement methods, which you highlighted. Now, do, the, do all these methods uh, require the involvement or input of the PPDA for the venture procurement of goods or services? Okay, uh, Julius, you've noted that question. Yeah. Okay, there's no other hand, so please uh, respond to that. And then uh, I'll... Um... There's another question. There's a question on the, on, the, on the group. The second question is, thank you, Julia. My question is about requirements in the bidding documents. Some companies come up with requirements in their evaluation process that were not asked in the documents and end up failing us even when we are even the lowest bidders. How can we help be helped because we end up losing? Okay, thank you very much. Mm. I think I'll, I'll spend the last question first. Mm. Uh, requirements. Uh, the evaluation process or the procurement process, usually when you send out bids, you have the, 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 the marking scheme. If I, if I may put it, you have the requirements, which is a marking scheme that's going to be followed during the evaluation. And unless formally communicated before bid submission, the entity is not supposed to change the marking scheme or the evaluation process. For example, if they said we want experience of uh, having uh, worked in the region or maybe experience of having supplied certain items before, then you're not supposed to change, the entity is not supposed to change the, the evaluation process in the middle. So entity is doing that, it's wrong. It's wrong and not supposed to do that. And uh, there's, of course, a method of appeal against that. One of them is uh, administrative reviews, which can be to the, to the entity, and of course, right now, maybe to the tribunal that, that are under the current law. So you can appeal against that, because they're not supposed to, to change the evaluation procedure at the time when the bid, bid period has already closed, because it's, it's assumed that you prepared and submitted your bid according to the requirements set out in the ITB, in the invitation to bid document. So they're not supposed to change at the time when the only way that they have all the everything with them, besides you don't have opportunity, and you don't have an opportunity to change them. So that is wrong. How can you be helped? One, you can uh, formally write to them, uh, indicating your displeasure about uh, things they've done, about change of goalposts. Uh, you can quote relevant laws, 
and also relevant clauses in the ITB. Uh, this is what we call administrative uh, administrative review. Uh, and then usually at that point, they'll respond to you formally and indicating reasons and also indicating why, whether it's, why it's actually allowed, uh, they had allowed for it, and maybe hadn't seen it, or maybe they, they can also cross out those, those, those new requirements that hadn't included. Uh, then Godfrey talked about involvement of PPDA in the different procurement methods. Uh, PPDA is a the public procurement and this public procurement is for the public assets authority. So it is a governing body which oversees procurement in the entire country. Uh, its involvement is not so much at this point in terms of procurement processes, but uh, it's involved in setting regulations, it's involved in auditing, and it's also involved in uh, uh, capacity building. The involvement in the, in, in the procurement at entity level is uh, rather, a bit rather remote, because usually at entity level, the entity now decides. But for example, when they're going to use the open bidding process, open bidding method, they need to, the entity will follow the thresholds which have been set by PPDA. If they're going to use a pre-qualification method, the entity will uh, rather uh, request for quotation method, the entity will have to follow the methods which have been set under guidelines for, for request for quotation, whether it's for works or services or, or, or whether it is uh, uh, work services or goods. Now, in, in the event they do not uh, follow the, the, the set out rules and regulations and don't follow the set out thresholds, PPD does audit, it audits these entities. Um, I know the big entities is really like basically every financial year, they'll audit uh, different ministries and, and these entities. So they'll come for audit. It's at that point they'll require a procurement plan. Then they require the, what procurements have, 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 have been ongoing. And of course, the PPD will point out areas where the entity, for example, uh, didn't follow the requirements in the law. But sometimes some entities may want to split down. For example, you have uh, a certain building to, to construct. It has a wall at the paving. So you first stay in order to, to avoid open bidding, let's first put the building halfway, then you push the build the boundary and then put the external service, the, the compound. So those are some, some cases where the authority would say you shouldn't have done splitting of the, of, of the different sections. But rather, you should have come down, you should have come up and, and done the whole construction as one, 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 uh, one item. So yeah, that's, that's the level of involvement in PD in these, in these uh, methods. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, there's a, a question from Rotman. While preparing powers of attorney, should it be open to any bid or specific to a certain client? Why do I need it yet? I assume a company is a separate entity eligible to transact in anything. That's the last question. Um, uh, so Julius, respond to that, and then I'll, I'll bring this to a close. Uh, th thank you. Um, th there are different types of uh, powers of attorney. There are some which are open, and there are some which are specific. Uh, for most big procurements, usually procurements over 1 million and above, most entities will require specific powers of attorney. They'll say, for example, if it's procurement for the for the uh, Let's say for the construction of uh, Mbarara Kasese Road, they require that uh, the entity, the, the supplier or the contractor provide specific uh, powers of attorney for that kind of work. Usually that's for the big items. But however, there are also open uh, powers of attorney, which, are, which, are, which usually they pick one of the director, whoever is doing business on behalf of the company and can use. So you need to look, look at the details. What, what does a ITBC, what does it, what does the document say? Do they require gen, uh, the generic uh, powers of attorneys or do they require a specific powers of attorney? And then you have to follow that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank Julius. Um, and I think we, we've noted the feedback from, from Jane that uh, uh, any hopes of inviting a tax body or banking institution for such presentation, since we have some burning questions, yes. We'll take that feedback and make arrangements. And uh, next time we'll bring you somebody from the tax authority and also from the financial sector. And then uh, also just to say that um, the presentation will be shared by email. We have all your emails, so we shall email you the presentation, but it's also available online on our YouTube channel. So you can go there and be able to access it. And uh, Engineer Julius, I want to thank you very, very much for such an excellent presentation. I think it's been very informative. 
And Welcome, for the entrepreneurs I'm here, I'm sure you agree that the opportunities are immense. I mean, he has listed the goods, the services that we can be able to tap into, and it's a whole spectrum and you can find yourself a niche. But you need to be able to uh, strengthen your ability to look for information. There's information out there. Go into the media, go onto the, uh, the websites of these government ministries and departments and, 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 and get information. So information seeking is a very uh, important competence we need to build to look for these opportunities because the opportunities are there, but you must look for them. But once you have looked for them, and you have information to prepare. And so when we go out and find information, I think it's critical that we prepare ourselves and see where we can fix ourselves. But also the issue of leveraging, leveraging partnerships. So we, we can't operate in isolation. Um, I think, I think Junior was talked about the experience. Yes, we know that many of us may not have experience but, but because you're still small. However, you can partner with somebody else who has experience. So you, you, need to, you need to identify your niche, where is your strength, and then leverage that and go for partnerships to be able to enter into this, into, into this new area. Registration, registration, re registration. So formalization, we need to formalize our businesses because if you are planning to grow this business beyond yourself, we need to get into formalization and to understand what it takes for us to go. So you need to be registered, issues of quality. You need to be able to have, to, to have to, if, if, uh, standards. Quality standards are very important. So we need to be able to do that. But most importantly, seek technical input. And I think Julius is available. And so if anybody needs further discussion in this area, please get back to myself, to anybody in Enterprise Uganda, and we shall connect you with Julius. Uh, he should be able to support you. We need to understand uh, the process of, 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 of uh, applying for, for these bids and uh, Julius is available on call and uh, I'll not share his number, but I want to ask that if you need any guidance, please reach out to Enterprise Uganda and we shall be able to provide that necessary support to you. And so with that, I want to thank you all very, very much for sparing your morning to get this information. I believe we are all better than we came in at the start.